with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. Let's stand together and join our voices with number 16 in your hymnal. We see your mighty works in the world that you have made, in the works of redemption for your people, people, and most holy, in the sending of your Son, Jesus Christ, that he as the Redeemer might bear our sins, give us new life, and raise us up in resurrection power on the last day. So Lord, we come in Jesus' name this morning to give you praise and to receive from your hand. So Father, bless us. Give us teachable hearts, send your word forth with power, and help us to respond uh, with joy, with thanksgiving, and with obedience. Father, may all that we do in this hour of worship be pleasing in your sight, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. In the back of your hymnal, we have the responsive readings of the Psalms. So this is on page 811, the responsive reading of Psalm 73, 811 is the page number. Ask you to respond, reading the bold in unison. Psalm 73. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. 
But as for me, my heart almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold. For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from the burdens common to man. They are not plagued by human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts comes iniquity. The evil conceits of their minds know no limit. They scoff and speak with malice. In their arrogance, they threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven, and their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore, their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They say, how can God know? Does the Most High have knowledge? This is what the wicked are like. Always carefree, increase in love. Surely in vain have I kept my heart pure. In vain have I washed my hands in innocence. All day long I have been plagued. I have been punished every morning. If I had said I will speak thus, I would have betrayed your children. When I tried to understand all this, it was impressive to me. Till I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. Surely you place them on slippery ground, cast them down to ruin. How suddenly are they destroyed, completely swept away by terrors? It's a dream when one awakes, so when you arise, O Lord, you will despise them as fancies. When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a rude beast before me. Yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart, my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell all your deeds. Amen. Let's join our hearts coming to the Lord in confession of sin this morning. Father, we come before you, the only true God, God of holiness and righteousness. And Lord, we are humbled to realize how much that shows where we have fallen short. We have not only turned away from your explicit commands, but we have lived in this world as though we did not belong to you. We've lived for the passing pleasures of this age instead. Father, forgive us for this willfulness, forgive us for our disobedience, forgive us for selfish ways of living. Our comfort, Father, is that we can come confessing this sin to you, to know you as a God of mercy and grace to your children. And furthermore, we look to that work of Christ, which spares us, the one who bore our sin, the one who reconciles us to you, our Father in heaven. We pray that once again we would find in Christ all that we need, not only to know assurance of our sins, but that we would uh, find uh, strength and power to rise above them and living in obedience before you. So, Father, hear our prayer of confession, renew our hearts, and lead us in the ways of righteousness that are pleasing to you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. It's from Romans. Chapter 8, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Such a simple statement, so profound. If this morning you're bringing that confession of sin, look into your Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and trusting in his finished work, promises for you, you're no longer condemned. 
you receive the favor of God now and forever. So I assure you, as a minister of the gospel, this grace belongs to you. Amen. Let's sing in response number 172. Let us love and sing and wonder. 172, let's stand. Come now to our congregational prayer this morning. The author to the Hebrews reminds us, since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you uh, that this day we can again draw near to you to know our God and maker, to know the one who uh, spoke the world into existence, and you uphold all things by the word of your power. Lord, we uh, can know your faithfulness to us in all things uh, throughout all of our lives. We especially um, declare once again that you are a God of grace to us through your son, Jesus Christ. And so we come to your throne, thankful that it is not a throne of condemnation, but a throne of grace where we can seek after those things that are pleasing to you, even knowing that you have promised to work all things together for our good and for your glory. Thank you that your providence uh, reaches to every detail of our lives. If you are concerned with even the hairs of our head, how much more with our health, our families, 
our need for, uh, for this life, uh, the needs of your church, uh, Lord, even the great concerns of this world, and there are many. Lord, we remember that every good gift uh, comes from your hand. We have often failed to remember that. We have lived as though we are our own provider. But Lord, we stop now to remember that all things are from your hand. You're the God who gives and you take away when it is pleasing to you. So help us to live to the praise of your glory. Help us to rest in your goodness. Father, we do pray that you would advance the gospel in this age, that you would extend the church, that you would advance your kingdom. Lord, we pray for friends and, and loved ones who have not turned to Christ or have resisted or in some cases even fallen away. We, Father, pray that you would be merciful in their lives, that you would send your spirit and renew them and draw them to yourself. Help us to live before them in a way that shows our faith in Christ and shows furthermore our desire to serve them and bless them as Christians. We pray for our neighbors in Easton and in the Lehigh Valley. We pray that you would work in the hearts of many to seek after spiritual things, that they would be drawn to the truth of your word and to a church home. Father, we pray that, that you would work in the lives of, of many, even in the surrounding community, to draw them to Trinity and, Lord, to join with this fellowship of believers. We pray in our region that you would be at work blessing faithful congregations and church plants. When we remember the three church plants of our presbytery, Christ Church and Good News uh, Mission Work and Park Church in Doylestown. Father, we pray that in each of these places, your word would go forth and that you would gather your people. Um, we pray that uh, these would be significant um, sources of witness uh, to new communities. Lord, we lift up our missionaries who are sent out in the farthest parts of the world. We pray that you would sustain them and bless their labors. We pray for John Grotenheis in Ethiopia. Uh, Lord, we pray also for missionaries uh, for the OPC, such as a Hero Hakobord in Ukraine. We pray, Father, that despite the challenges of missionary work and even the war zone, that you would bless his labors and that you would send the gospel forth with power. Lord, we pray for other areas of the world that are distressed by war, famine, and disease, that uh, you would that you'd be merciful and that you'd even use these needs to draw people to yourself. Give believers the opportunity to minister a cup of cold water and, and many other forms of compassion to those who are needy. We pray for a refugee ministries uh, such as the one carried out by the Greek Evangelical Church in Volos. We ask, Lord, that, um, that they in particular would be strengthened and given the resources they need to minister to many people who are displaced in this day and age. Pray that many would hear and believe the good news. Lord, here at Trinity, we thank you for your faithful servant, Pastor Tipton. We ask, oh Lord, that uh, you would bless him in his work here and in the other ways that he serves through his teaching gifts. Or bless his family and provide for their needs as well. Lord, we pray that uh, as a whole congregation, we would be those who love your word and live according to it. That we would uh, find joy in serving one another and participating in the life of the church with the gifts that you've given to us. Lord, we pray for the ministry uh, that takes place to uh, for members of, of the congregation according to their various needs. Uh, Lord, bless these works. Uh, provide for the needs of your people. We thank you for the children of the church. We pray for those who are involved in teaching them and serving them each week, that you would bless them in these good, good works. Father, we lift up our brother Tom Foe. We pray that with the cataract procedure coming up, that uh, you would bless that and make it successful. Be near to Jack, Gavin, and Hospice. We pray for Brenda Broadbent recovering these days from surgeries. Lord, there are many on our prayer list. We lift them up. You know these needs fully, but we remember once again, Joey Olaf, Lord's husband, Don, the Gavin's daughter, Jacqueline, Ms. Mari Laubach and Tim Scudder, 
Father, in each of these cases, we pray that uh, you would be merciful, that, um, that, uh, that you would bring comfort and healing in, in most of these cases. Father, give us help in our temptation and distress. You know the things that weigh upon us individually. Help us to look to Christ each day. Help us to live in humility. Lord, help us to be faithful in prayer. You tell us to pray for those who lead us in our, in our nation in a civic capacity. We pray for them, Lord, for national, state, local officials. Lord, give them wisdom and grace for their responsibilities. We pray that in our society that there would be a turning to you, a, a true revival, not something that's simply outward or reflection of hot new trends, but that there would be a true turning of hearts to you, O Lord, and that we would continue to see the glory of your kingdom covering the earth as the waters cover the sea. Lord, hear our prayer. Forgive our sins. Lead us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We continue our worship through the giving of our offerings unto the Lord. This time we'll collect that and then stand for the doxology at the end. We thank you for providing for us. We ask that you use these gifts for the extension of your kingdom, for the blessing of your church. And Father, now help us to be ready to hear from your word this morning, and that we would not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from your mouth. Uh, Father, hear us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. It's so nice to be with you, and it's a pleasure to open God's Word. I think the last time I was here at Trinity uh, to, to preach and to be with you for the morning was probably before the pandemic, which sounds like ages ago, doesn't it? Um, but it's, it's nice to be back. Um, I'll be uh, leading a little presentation on home missions, on church planting during the Sunday school hour, so I um, hope many can, can stay for that. Um, your encouragement and for my encouragement too as uh, I get to spend time with with you one of my supporting congregations in the presbytery our sermon passage is from second peter three the very last five verses second peter three starting at verse 14. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. 
and count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these manners. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. <coughs> but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. As far as the reading of God's word. Just about a week ago, I was able to take a trip back to see my parents in the Denver, Colorado area. And wanting to save a little bit of money, I flew home on a red-eye flight overnight, which meant I was arriving at the Philadelphia airport at about 5 a.m. Now, normally this is a rather quiet time of day. However, the very gate where our flight was arriving, there was another flight getting ready to depart. And it looked like it was going to be a flight full of young families on their way to Orlando. Now, let me remind you, it was five o'clock a.m. These families had probably already been awake for at least an hour and a half. I mean, having to get to the airport and get through security and they'd begun to wait. If any of them had a longer drive to the airport, it wouldn't be surprising if they had been awake since 3 a.m. or maybe even 2.30 a.m. But you would have thought this crowd was celebrating a birthday party or New Year's or a Phillies World Series victory. Everyone was so alive and alert and socializing and laughing. Parents were dressed in festive, tropical-looking outfits. Little girls were dressed up like their favorite princess characters. What would explain why this crowd of people was apparently having so much fun at this dreadfully early hour of the day? You know why. It's vacation. They were all about to leave to go on vacation in Florida to enjoy the sunshine and maybe see Mickey Mouse. Even at 5 a.m., the wait was part of the great excitement of the Florida vacation's arrival at long last. It was a clear picture of how waiting doesn't have to be unpleasant. It really depends on what you're waiting for. In fact, if you are waiting for some truly wonderful thing, the wait itself takes on a different character altogether. It's exciting. Your heart is riveted by this thing that you are having to wait by these, through all these passing moments until it finally gets there. The delay is a foretaste of the thing itself. You can see it on the face of a bride and groom on the day of their wedding. You can see it when you go to a graduation gathering, even though it takes a very long time. The wait is part of the enjoyment. Our passage in 2 Peter today, which is, of course, the very end of the book of 2 Peter, it's about how we look at this time of waiting. Waiting, in this case, for the trumpet to sound and for Jesus to return and for the day of judgment and for the arrival of the new heavens and the new earth. What kind of wait did Peter think these early Christians could expect? And, and what kind of wait can we expect? Well, I want to look at for a moment at where the book of Second Peter has been to make some observations about this wait, because this is something of a theme throughout the book, although we're just looking at the last few verses. One thing that we would see earlier in the book, if we were to read it all the way through, is that this weight is sometimes construed as a sign that God's word cannot be trusted. Let me show you in particular in chapter 3, verse 3 and 4, where it says this. It says, 
chapter 3, verse 3, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. Scoffers that are saying, look, there, there's nothing that's going to happen. It sounds like the cynics of our own time who would mock Christianity and say, look, you're foolish to expect that there's going to be some miracle. You're foolish to think that God is going to act in this world in a supernatural way. They question whether Jesus rose again. And here they're saying it's impossible that Jesus is going to come back on the clouds. God's word cannot be true. Because for many, it doesn't fit with their outlook on life. So one thing that characterizes this time of waiting is those who would question the truth of God's promises in his word. Another characteristic of this time of waiting is for many, it is an occasion for spiritual regression or, or what we'd say is just sin and wickedness. And again, this is something that comes up a number of times in Second Peter. The apostle is saying, be on guard lest you get sucked in to the sinful temptations of this world. And actually, he's thinking also those who come into the church and through their false teaching would lead people astray and lead them into various forms of wickedness. Let me read for you a few, verse, a few verses in chapter 2 that give warning against following those who set this pattern. It talks about those in verse 10 who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. That doesn't sound very good. Verse 14, they have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed. Verse 19 in chapter 2, they promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. In verse 21, it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. All of those verses are describing within the context of the church a pattern of people falling away from righteousness during this wait during this time in which some very bad influences will be found even in the household of god we see the same patterns today increasing pressure towards sinful temptation which would draw away even professing believers. And sadly, I think we probably would say we do see much of that. It's as though the weight of the Christian life is just too much for some. They make shipwreck of the faith through letting down their guard and sliding into various forms of sin. So one part of the weight is people questioning God's word. Another part of the weight is we see people sliding into sin. And third, through this time of wait, which maybe some, which some see as, as, as being agitated, looking for something greater. They're looking for a more exciting, more interesting, more mysterious form of teaching than the gospel we know of Jesus Christ. In other words, the wait will invite the spread of false teaching and false gospels. This is the warning at the start of chapter 2. But it comes up in many places in Second Peter and in other parts of the New Testament. We need to be on guard for those who would bring a new message, trying to pass this off as the Christian message. Again, the question is, do we see any of that in our own time? Of course, right? We still live in this age of waiting in which we see far too much of this. Simply turn on your television or open up a website and you'll see people trying to pass off Christianity as though it's simply a matter of health and wealth that God will give you. A get rich scheme. Or maybe a means of feeling good about yourself 
or a moralistic message. Try harder and God will love you. Right? We could go on and on. There's all kinds of different ways that people twist the biblical message. And what comes out is something very different than Christianity. It's clear that the longer the wait, the more forms of false teaching we see trying to pass as Christian faith. So according to 2 Peter, this time of waiting is full of many perils and dangers. We can make this even more personal. Can you relate to this idea that life is sometimes just too hard to endure? I mean, the source of distress could be a, a frustrating job, a, a very difficult boss, financial strain, addiction, depression, a relationship that seems to deteriorate. You feel like sometimes you just can't endure that, that you're reaching your breaking point. All of us begin to feel that way. I can feel that way with the things that I struggle with. We all feel that way. We just don't know if we can endure as we feel these pressures and struggles. But it's at this point, the point where it seems difficult, if not impossible, that we need to remember what God's word says about the passage of time. That we're not subject to random forces in this world that are out of God's control. The Bible also tells us that we don't live with uncertainty about what lies before us. But God's word tells us crucial details about this time of waiting. And as Peter closes up this short book, 2 Peter presents important reminders for all of us about how we are to be waiting, how we are to view this seemingly slow and tedious passage of time. The most important thing to remember is that during this time, we live between the first coming of Jesus Christ and his return. The age of the church is a limited time as we wait for our Savior's return. He is surely coming. And because this is so clear and so important for the Christian outlook, it shifts our priorities and it changes the character of the wait. In particular, our passage highlights three ways that this time of waiting is changed because of the return of Jesus Christ. First, we'll see in here that we are to live intentionally as God's people as we wait. Second, we live scripturally because this truth is taught elsewhere. And third and finally, we live Christ-centeredly. I just made up that word. I've never heard anyone use that word before, but I turned it to add Christ-centeredly. There's got to be a Christ-centered character to our life in light of where our hope and expectation is found. So let's see how this works out. First, waiting intentionally as God's people. Verse 14 and the beginning of 15. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation. As we noted that these things for which you're waiting, it's, it's everything associated with the very end. In fact, I mean, just look back to the previous verse 13 about the new heavens and the new earth, and about four verses before that, clearly talking about expectation of Christ's return. It's all these events associated with the end that we are waiting for. And Peter says, in light of these things, we are to be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. Now, Jesus himself spent a lot of time talking about how to be ready for his return. He told a bunch of parables to help us understand the nature of that wait in Matthew chapter 24 and 25. There Jesus says we ought to be like the faithful servant who is always ready for the return of his master, although it would come at an unexpected hour. You remember that parable? Or Jesus compares it to five of the ten virgins who are waiting for the bridegroom. Five are not ready, but five are ready. Because they've kept extra oil for their lamps so that when he arrives, they would be prepared. 
Or Jesus says we ought to be like the servants who were faithful with the talents given to them. They'd be ready to give an account on the day that the master returns. In each of these cases, what's most important is to remain ready. You see, all of them in these parables had planned their lives and priorities accordingly. And of course, so also the only people who are ready for Christ's sudden appearance are those who are found trusting in him and living for him. It's interesting, it says that we ought to be found without spot or blemish on that day. This is a metaphor for purity. It's the kind of language in the Bible uh, used for the sacrifices in the Old Testament where believers are said, you need to bring a, a lamb, but not one with the dark spots. It has to be a perfect lamb, uh, only pure white, pure and spotless. Symbolically, this is looking ahead to the perfect righteousness and purity of Jesus Christ, who alone, of course, can wash away our sin and guilt because he himself was sinless and guiltless so that he might be that sufficient atoning sacrifice for us by his own spotlessness and, and, and purity. In fact, Peter, in, in his earlier epistle, refers to Jesus' way. You can turn back about five pages to 1 Peter 1, 19. Or it reminds us we've been ransomed with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Same phrase. <coughs> so Jesus is the only one who is truly without spot or blemish, but those who are found in him by saving faith also can be found without spot or blemish as they are purified through Christ. It's also interesting that one of the main ways that these false teachers and all of their wickedness is described as, as, as those who are blots and blemishes, 2 Peter 2, 13. So you can see Christians are to stand out in their faithfulness, abiding in Christ and resisting the temptation to follow these, these false teachers who would lead them in a wicked direction. So to wait intentionally, faithfully, Counting the patience of our Lord as salvation, it says in verse 15. That's probably reminding Christians what he explained earlier in chapter 3, that when God delays in sending these events at the very end, that is, that is not God forgetting, but the very delay is an expression of grace. As God is giving time for sinners to turn and repent and to find refuge in Christ. Second Peter 3 9 says, don't, don't think that this delay is anything other than God's grace being expressed that many would turn to him. So it seems like delay from one point of view is really an expression of patience and undeserved mercy for those who might turn to God. Verse 17 as well teaches God's people ought to wait in faithfulness not being carried away with the error of lawless people, but to live in faithfulness, abiding in Christ, turning away from the error of lawless people um, and their various corruptions. When you add it up, the wait for Christ's return would have us to be quite busy. Quite busy. We have a lot to do. We have to keep our eyes on Christ and to be on guard against false teaching and evil temptations and to be filled with spiritual fruits like peace. When you also think that God calls us to do that in the context of our, our home life, our relationships, our workplaces, our school, you just see God has given us a lot to do during this time in which we are waiting. We're not waiting with nothing to do but we are waiting in a very intentional way, filling our time with reflections of our faith in Christ. This is what it means to wait intentionally or deliberately. These few days that remain before Christ returns, at least few in comparison with eternity, 
They ought to be filled with expressions of standing firm in Christ for our spiritual good and for our service to the Lord. But the second thing to characterize our wait during this time is we are to wait scripturally. I just love this passage that Peter slips in here at this point in, in 2 Peter. It concerns the other apostle, Paul, who wrote about these same things. It says this especially in verses 15 and 16, but let me start at verse 14. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace, and count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. You, therefore, knowing this, take care you're not carried away by the error of lawless people. See, at the heart of this closing passage is the comment that the Apostle Peter has also written about these same, the Apostle Paul has also written about these same things. Even though Peter acknowledges Paul is hard to understand, that's not an excuse to twist his message into something other than it is. As I studied this passage, I wondered, is there some particular passage of Paul, in Paul's letters that Peter is thinking of here? The closest I can come up with is maybe Romans 2, verse 4. You could flip there if you want to. Romans 2, 4 is where Paul writes to the Romans, Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? See, here in Romans, Paul is also explaining that the delay of God's judgment ought to be seen as an expression of God's patience and of his grace. It gives sinners time to repent and to find refuge in Christ. So it's possible that Paul, uh, that Peter is thinking of this part in Romans as he's writing this conclusion to Second Peter. But then again, perhaps he's thinking of a different place. He doesn't give an exact quotation. He doesn't even refer to which of Paul's epistles he's thinking of. It could be a different part of one of the epistles in our New Testament, or even something that Paul wrote that we don't have in our New Testament. You know, there was, there's indication that Paul wrote at least one or two letters to the Corinthians that are not in the New Testament. And of course, he wrote with apostolic authority. So perhaps it's even from something that we don't have, we don't know. But regardless of which exact passage Peter has in mind, isn't it amazing that here, Peter calls the writings of Paul, Scripture. <coughs> scripture, look at the end of verse 16. Um, <clears throat> the ignorant and unstable twist these writings of Paul to their own destruction as they do the other Scriptures. The undeniable implication here is that Paul's epistle is to be seen as scripture along with the rest of God's inspired word. Peter and the other apostles were aware God was inspiring their writings to be authoritative in leading the New Testament, the New Covenant Church. And Paul in particular is seen as faithfully expounding this gospel so that Peter can call his writings scripture for us. Isn't it also comforting that Peter also had trouble at times understanding everything that Paul wrote. We can identify with that. We've read passages of the Bible and thought to ourselves, Man, I don't really understand what's going on here. It's okay to admit that if we're puzzled by certain details in the Bible. If Peter found it hard, it's okay if we find some things hard to understand as well. Of course, we ought to be quick to remember that what to be especially confident in what is clear in the Bible. The whole nature of the gospel message is very clear. And so we try to interpret what is unclear in light of what is clear. That's a good principle of, of reading the Bible. So to summarize, we live in this time of waiting for Christ's return and the end of days. But in that wait, we ought to be intentional about waiting in Christ 
to be faithful to our Lord. And secondly, we wait scripturally. We acknowledge there's many parts of the Bible that urge us to this same posture, understanding how to live faithful in this age in which we live. But third, we are to live Christ-centeredly. Christ-centeredly, my, my new word for the day. This is already implied in what we saw before, but gives special emphasis in verse 18. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Here's our marching orders. Here in summary is how we're to live and fill our time as we wait for the Lord Jesus Christ to return. <coughs> Here's the mandate for every Christian. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The fact that we are exhorted to grow in grace, it reminds us that God's work is, is not yet finished in us. Not until we are complete in holiness and righteousness, just like our Lord at the end of this life. <coughs> so in the meantime, we are to put off the old ways of sin, put on the new ways of life in Christ. When we see parts of our life that we know are not pleasing to the Lord, our thoughts and our actions and our words. Our desire is to repent. That is not only look to God for forgiveness, but to hate those sins and to, to flee from them. And in this life, we ought to have a special love for the, the ways that God strengthens us spiritually through his word and through the sacraments and prayer. Whenever we have the opportunity to be strengthened by the means of grace as we do today, we ought to count it as precious. This is what God is using that we would fulfill this passage to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has called us to faith and holiness. We are responsible to pursue that in our daily life. Besides growing in grace, it says grow in knowledge. The Bible encourages us to grow in knowledge. It's not talking about merely taking in information. We're not just sort of machines collecting information in our daily life. The way that we grow in knowledge that comes from God is to remember the very personal dimension to that knowledge since we are God's people. We're his covenant people whom he has redeemed. And he speaks to us as our personal God who loves us and cares for us. So to grow in knowledge is to shape our character because we know the one who speaks to us and is leading us. But to both be a hearer of God's word and a doer as we receive it and let it change us. We have to be teachable before the Holy Spirit to advance his good work in each of us. When we read all of 2 Peter, it's obvious that we're created in the image of God. And in that spiritual nature, we can either grow and see that grace advance or there can be regression. That's why we have to Take seriously the work of progressing in the Christian life through growing in the knowledge of Christ. That knowledge of Christ flowing from God's revealed word is the safest way, the most sure way to abound in the grace of God and stay on the path of faith and righteousness. The Christ-centered life is the Christ-glorifying life. Second Peter ends with a doxology. Not just a doxology to God, but to Jesus, to him, be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. The doxology to the incarnate, crucified, risen and exalted Lord Jesus Christ, the one mediator between God and man, the Lord and head of the church. As we remain on the faithful path, we do bring glory to Jesus Christ. We prove the wonders of his grace, not only in this age, but for eternity to come, as he is worthy. Amen? Among all the books of the Bible, this one's maybe especially memorable because Peter writes, and in the early part of chapter one says, this may be the last time I write to you. 
I know that my days are not going to be much longer. And so you kind of get this picture. These, these are his parting words. These are his dying words to the church to encourage them in their Christian faith. He points them to press on in faith in Christ, following the example of many others who in their final days I want to do nothing else but point others to Christ that they would persevere and follow. I began the sermon reflecting on my experience at an airport where a crowd of families was happy to wait because the wait was a reminder of the joy on the other end of that flight when they arrived in Florida. But I should note that I've also passed through the Orlando airport at an early morning hour. And there I've seen families at the other end of that vacation. Maybe you've seen this too. You see those same families up early in the morning and they suffer through the security line, flying back to Philly, back to school, back to work, back to normal life. Believe me, you've never seen such haggard expressions, such depressed people as when they're finishing that week of dream vacation and they have to go back to real life. But this is what makes the wait for Christ so different. The one whose heart is set on Christ and his kingdom will never be disappointed by what you experience after the wait. Indeed, so great is the joy. The Bible always assures us tears will be wiped away. Doubts will be removed. The full wonder and joy of God's gift in Christ will finally be fully known, never to be lost. This is why it's so often the case in the Bible that the return of Christ is given as a reminder to give us joy and perseverance in the meantime. Romans 13, 11, besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. You gotta help us to do that. To wait expectantly and to say, come Lord Jesus, come quickly. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, which exposes our weakness and frailty. It also points us to our hope in Christ and what he has done in the hope of his return. Lord, grant that we would not uh, be drawn away, enticed by the promises and passing pleasures of this world. Help us to keep our eyes on our Savior, that we would be able to endure with joy and hope in him. Lord, guide us in your truth. Fill us with your spirit. Finish this good work in us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we uh, come now uh, to the Lord's Supper, uh, Ask uh, for those who are administering the supper with me to uh, come forward. First, I want to read from the institution of the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians 11. All rights, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. 
Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as, as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Lord's Supper is given by Jesus Christ to people in his church, his disciples, be a sign and a seal of the covenant of grace in him. The purpose, which is very clear in what we read, is for the Christian church to continue to practice this for just as long until he returns. It's not only a reminder of what he has done at the cross, uh, where the breaking of his body and the shedding of his blood alone is what saves us. But it is a foretaste of that marriage supper of the Lamb, of what is yet coming. And in this way, it very much is in keeping with the passage that we are just looking at in Second Peter. That we live in light of what Christ has done, but we also are anticipating that day of his return and the renewal of all things. So may God use this to strengthen us in our faith and give us perseverance as we look for his return. Lord's Supper is for those who have come to a saving knowledge of Christ, confess their sin, return to him and are seeking to live faithfully. For those who have also joined themselves uh, to a Bible-believing church to receive kind of oversight and accountability that we all need. If that is true of you, I invite you to share in this meal as a brother or sister following the Lord Jesus. If you have not come to faith, you're harboring some form of great unfaithfulness that you uh, will not turn away from. If you have not professed that faith and joined a Bible-believing church, we ask that you would refrain and that you would look to Christ and make strides of discipleship in those ways, that you would not be held back any longer if you had to come to this table soon in the future. Let's pray and ask for God's blessing as we um, come to uh, the table. Father, just as you give us food and drink for our physical bodies, you nourish us through Jesus Christ unto eternal life, even using this very simple meal to point us to Christ. But by your blessing, would you help us to look past these physical elements to the spiritual reality that they symbolize? Christ, our Lord, who was crucified, is now risen and exalted and reigning over us. Father, we pray that we would remember this um, sharing together in this meal uh, is a, a shepherding act uh, of the good shepherd, even as under shepherds administer it to us. So Lord, use this to strengthen us that we would find uh, a power uh, to live by faith in Christ, the power that you give us by your spirit. Lord, set apart these common and ordinary things for your holy purpose. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and blessed it, and broke it, gave it to his disciples as I, ministering in his name, give this to you.
Jesus said, take and eat. This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, our Savior took the cup, and having given thanks, he gave it to his disciples as I minister in his name. Give this to you. Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Drink of it, all of you. Let's stand and sing in response. Number 598, guide me, O thou great Jehovah. Let's stand. 598. of your God, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
Amen.